And now I am going to introduce our poets for this evening. Um, and we're going to start with Susanna Case. Susanna has authored eight books of poetry, most recently The Damage Done, Broadstone Books 2022, which won her a third Pinnacle Book Achievement Award. Her books have previously also won an IPI, um, a, a NYC Big Book Award Distinguished Favorite Award, and she was a finalist for the Eric Hoffer Book Award and the International Book Awards. The first of her five chapbooks, The Scottish Cafe, Slappering Hall Press, which means Sleepy Hollow in Old Dutch, was re-released in a dual language English-Polish version. And please forgive me if I mispronounce this beautiful title. Kawirna Skaka by Opole University Press. She co-edited with Margot Taft Stever the anthology I Want to Be Loved by You. Poems on Marilyn Monroe, Milk and Cake Press 2022. Case worked several decades as a university professor and program coordinator in New York City and currently is co-editor of Slappering Hall Press and a co-host of the literary series WE, Poets of the Pandemic and Beyond. For more information, you can find Susanna Chase on, on the web. At, her website is called, her website is her name. Apologies, Susanna H. Case, and I will put it in the chat, so don't worry. I'll definitely make sure it's in there. Um, I'm also going to introduce Margot Taft Stever. She will uh, start after Susanna. Margot Taft Stever's three full length poetry collections include The End of Horses, Broadstone Books, 2022, winner of a 2022 Pinnacle Book Achievement Award, Cracked Piano, Cavan Carey Press, 2019, finalist with honorable mention for the 2021 Eric Hoffer Award Grand Prize, and Frozen Spring, winner of the 2022 Mid, Mid List Press First Series Award for Poetry. The latest of her four chapbooks is Ghost Moose, Caddy Wampus Press 2019. Her poems have appeared in magazines and anthologies, including Plume, Verse Daily, Poem a Day on Poets.org, Prairie Schooner, Connecticut Review, Cincinnati Review, Upstreet, and Salamander. She is founder of the Hudson Valley Writers' Center and founding and current co-editor of Slappering Hall Press. As adjunct assistant professor in the bioethics department of the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University, she taught a 2021 workshop on poetry and bioethics. She teaches a poetry workshop for at-risk adolescents at Children's Village in Dobbs Ferry, New York. Her website will also be in the chat, Margot Taft Stever. So thank you for again joining us this evening. And Susanna, take it away. Thank you, Anita. I put some links in the chat as well for both Margot's book and my book and our websites as, as well. And also a link for the uh, Marilyn Monroe anthology. It's a pleasure to be reading with Margot tonight. I've known Margot for 20 years and we met originally when the Scottish Cafe, which you mentioned in the bio, won the Slapping Hall Press chapbook competition, which Margot will talk a little about later when she reads. So I'm going to start and read mostly from my latest book, although I'm going to read a few other things at the end. And uh, let's see, if I, this is the book, The Damage Done. And it is a, um, a long narrative in 43 parts about the malfeasance of the FBI in the middle part of the 20th century, a very different FBI from today in which um, at that time, uh, due to the influence of J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI was 
harassing progressive groups and members of those groups and people who contributed to progressive causes. And so in this narrative sequence of Holmes, the protagonist is a woman named Janie, who is a target because of her support of progressive causes. And at the beginning, she is dead and her story is told in flashback. So I'm going to read primarily from the early part of the book before we see everything that happens, but which sets the stage. And I'm going to begin with the home in which he's found in her car. This is woman in recumbent in car. A car sits in violation of parking rules, the only car on the street. In it, blonde hair peeks out from a blanket on the seat. It's early in the morning, a tow truck operator new on the job. He's back from vacation, wonders if he should have remained on the beach, the blanket reminding him of scratchy sand, pina coladas, his newly minted wife. Every day, people come back from vacation to tragedies. Picture him sitting in his truck, waiting for the police as he plays cuts from blonde on blonde. Every day, people listen to these songs. He's a Dylan, classic rock, appassionato, wonders if the dead woman is a debutante like Edie Sedgwick in Just Like a Woman. He wonders if his new wife is full of feminine tricks. This next part introduces one of the iconic characters of the narrative, the New York City detective, and it's called The Detective Can't Sleep. If he smokes too much, maybe he won't think too much. So here are the Marlboros, and there are the backup Marlboros, and here are his teeth, a yellowing, broken up roadway of too many cigarettes. He's thinking about a pigeon grazing nearby, a cooing ruin, how every trash pigeon in New York City is descended from a banded homing pigeon that didn't go straight home. Nights, he tosses, sweats. It's the D-ball, steroid for weightlifting. It's the rust-colored stain on his bedroom ceiling that looks like a fish, one with no insides, like the drawing a child makes. But his son is bored of drawing, his woman not looking at him fondly. It's the dead that keep him awake, and a crowd hovering, like today, at a double feature of the gorgeous, grotesque, noticing something not right. This is woman identified. A Tootsie Roll with arms, the detective calls Janie now that they've ID'd her. She's skinny with a single name like Twiggy, a vogue spread and being dead warrant consideration by the tabloids, a close up of her face that's not a death mask, a point of view that tisk tisks. Here's a sorry chick who couldn't hack the good life. She's pretty, angles like knife blades, torso straight like a boy's. In the largest image, Janie looks untroubled and is running in a bold pattern dress past a bridge, debris in soft focus piled off by the side. The detective laughs about it later with his buddies, a strange photo to sell clothes you can't even clearly see, surrounded by rubble, painted on eyelashes as if she's a child's doll. She looks as if she could blow away. Part of her did. So um, a lot of Janie's story, since she's dead at the beginning, as I said, is told in flashback. And this is one of the flashbacks, flashback bedroom. Blame the walls and doors. They entice the husband to punch them. Five stitches on his right wrist just last summer. Inanimate objects only. He says he is a man of peace. His familiar rage, it doesn't cease with three days in a row of humid heat, 90 degrees, and how come Janie wasn't in her room in Taos after the shoot? 
like an asymptote she's gotten so close to perfection can taste how close like she tastes the black coffee water sugarless gum all she's had for days so tired of being shown off like an expensive watch her precision surgery on her food he critiques her microscopic cutting and how did her ass blow up overnight the mirror is relentless the water, she drinks too much of it, needs to do more calisthenics, the weight on the scales unchanging, the food she pretends to eat, sometimes she has to put a small bit in her mouth, exercise the gain away or purge, but anything is better than throwing up again. The rules for when he can look at her, only when dressed or when the lights are out, darkness and cover. Her ribs, where downy pale white fur has begun to grow, though she is freezing all the time. The room of ecru walls, the color picked from over 30 variations of beige. For weeks, samples were shuffled and placed on their bed while she tried to decide. His only comment, that nothing was getting laid on their bed lately except the paint swatches. Blame the husband. He likes them thin and young. Um, this one is a, a poem in the form of a letter, and there are several of these in the book. And this is, it's also a flashback before the dinner party. Dear black lace Balenciaga flamenco dress I found in a secondhand shop in London. Thank God for the old couture more fun than getting newer versions as presents from wealthy men with large expectations so decadent the cost of clothes dear memory that never fully leaves of the crowded family cabin where mother died in the west virginia hills the roof leaking the steps down from the porch creaking dear beaded velvet shoes to go with the dress to rough it up dear side swept pixie hair dear pills and, and that the letter is signed, Janie. There are also other letters where I insert myself into the uh, story as well. This is police procedure. The question is, what do you say if the police want to have a little conversation? You haven't watched enough cop shows on TV. The question is, are you likely to get beat up or shot in the crash pad where you sleep on a fold-out cot if you refuse a trip to the station? They can hurt you anywhere. The question is, will they find the Cult 38 Super in the cabinet? Yes, you should have hidden it better. Their question is, are you talking black but sleeping white? How would they know anything about that? Their question is, who killed her? What were you doing and who are your witnesses for last Tuesday night? We were friends. We hung out, you try to explain. They shrug. People don't always know what they know. It's very hard to write about the 60s without writing about Vietnam. And this next uh, section is inspired by the uh, Battle of Khe San in Vietnam. And it's um, the setting is the detective who's one of the characters in this goes to visit his brother who has been injured in Vietnam. And it, it's uh, this section is called a free fire zone means anything that moves can be shot. Talking again about how green everything was, the fire and smoke, the mountains and silence, the jungle, which he never gets past when he tries to tell the story about how anything that moves is shot. And he was shot. And here he is now in their parents' home, instead of a rat's ass chronic care veterans facility, has been like this for years body broken, shrapnel still in his head, trying to talk to his older brother 
the detective who's wondering if the kid wants to die because someone now will have to do it for him. And all he had needed to do was stall a little bit. The war was winding down or be some other place on some other hill, not that hill where nothing will ever grow back, a monument to ill conception instead of here now crying again, some spittle on his lips. And this is flashback origin story. She rang up toilet paper and six packs at the supermarket, knew if she didn't get out soon, she might as well plan on being at the checkout forever. Her gang of girls borrowed an old Kodak, dressed her up, miniskirt, fishnet pantyhose, waistcoat, tie. They lined her eyes, dark and thick, made her believe she could be in magazines. The Janie who left for New York City at 16 cobbled together bus fare with money she'd saved from her minimum wage, dribbles from these high school friends and an aunt who was drinking the middle of her life away in a log cabin up in the West Virginia hills, a cabin made of trees, felled, stripped, pegged by hand. The aunt lit her kitchen up in flames one night and Janie didn't want to die in a house fire before she got old enough to lose her teeth. Too big for your britches, that aunt had laughed at her yearning for fame, but handed her an extra 20 crumpled dollar bills for an emergency. Something to get you started back after you see it lacks what you're expecting. She arrived in the city with a list of modeling agencies, a stack of fashion magazines, and the addresses of a couple of women's residential hotels. All the clothes and makeup she owned, double bagged, the name of the supermarket stenciled on the front. In the um, intro, you mentioned the anthology that Margot and I co-edited, and this is it. It's a rather large, almost fashion magazine looking um, anthology called I Want to Be Loved by You, and it's poems on Marilyn Monroe. And we have 91 different poets, some alive, some no longer alive, who have contributed to the um, anthology. And I wanted to read my contribution. And it's called Atomic Blonde. And if you've seen the film Niagara, that's the film that inspired this poem. If you haven't seen the film Niagara, I recommend that you see it. You can get it on Amazon Prime. Atomic Blonde. A woman labeled a tramp in a tight dress in the first half of any 1953 movie is going to be dead by its second half, like in Niagara. Marilyn playing vampy Rose Loomis, passion kissing her lover behind a barrier to the falls, the water, a symbol of rutting life force, if ever there were one, is later strangled by her husband, George, in revenge. I had that husband too, who'd already tried to cut off my air at home, a pillow over my face. This wasn't a film and I fought back. Why were we at Niagara on vacation? I'd left the lover in New York City to kiss and mess around with on my return, no intent to coax him into a killing by a waterfall. I wanted only to be pushed out, too indecisive by nature just to leave. But in this marriage, I always had to do the cleaning up. Not a femme fatale, I was more the Polly Cutler type, the one who takes a first aid kit on vacation to soothe all possible injuries. But my George Loomis didn't steal a boat and drop to his end over the falls. When we got home, I got the papers and he signed them. I was at a reading the other day and the host cut his fingers on something. And I said, I was going, you know, off to find a Band-Aid. And I said, oh, I have a Band-Aid in my purse. And I said, what are you doing carrying Band-Aids in your purse? And I said, I said, I'm the Polly Cutler type. She's character in the film and she's always prepared for 
everything. I, I'm not always prepared for everything, but I do carry band-aids. So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to finish with um, a newer poem. And uh, this is called Night Guatemala City. Prostitutes line streets of the rich, ambulantes outside fancy houses, walls around properties topped with broken glass. It's where to find men with money, not like La, La Linnea, sex sold in shacks by old railroad tracks, where even driving by to look is dangerous. Babies are sold too, children selling children beholden to gangs. What can philosophy say about adversity like this really? Schopenhauer thought suffering was inevitable, the nature of life, life not worth living, that we should shelter ourselves with art. We could be like my dogs, heads hidden by blankets, each leaves itself protected. Oh, painting, how can art blanket anyone? Prostitutes line canvases of impressionism, dancing, drinking, resting. See Olympia reclining, her face coarse, sallow, expressionless. The marketplace is busy everywhere. Working women die destitute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susanna. Beautiful pieces. Margo, we lost Margo. <laughs> I'm here. I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, but I can't. I mean, we can't see. You. I mean, I can see you. Okay, I, Susanna, I, can you see Margo? No, but I can see you, and I can see Susanna. I don't. I. Okay. I mean, I got kicked off, and I went back on, but now I don't know what to do. Because it doesn't give me an option to un, you know, there's no I'm gonna, option. Okay, I'm I've, okay, we'll be rejoining. It says here that you'll be rejoining the webinar as a panelist. There you are. Yay! Oh no, you're muted, Margo. There, there, there. Okay, there, there we go. Okay. Yeah, that I guess I just came on not as a panelist, so that was the problem. Okay. So. You were though. No, and I, I know. Was like, I, I, I thought I, you maybe you had gone away to. Get no, a I got of kicked off. I would. I got kicked off, and then I had to rejoin, and and so I wasn't a pan. Then I wasn't a panelist. I'm sorry, you're back. Sorry. Well, you're back. We're we're all good. Yeah. Great. Okay. <clears throat> would you like me to start? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juanita Vega de Joseph, Jennifer Beggins, and the Free Library of Philadelphia for this reading series. And I wanted to thank Susanna for her wonderful reading and for being such a great friend and poetry comrade. And I wanted to read a few poems from my first book, Frozen Spring. I've been writing a lot on eco-poetic themes, and this is one of, I'll read a couple of them from my pre two previous books. Conversation with Bertolt Brecht begins with an epigraph by Brecht. Solely because of the increasing disorder in our cities of class struggle, some of us have now decided to speak no more of cities by the sea, snow on roofs, women. As if the Chilean songs of revolution would bring back the gray fishing boats sailing through frail deepening waters at dawn and the seagulls making earthly sounds. As if these songs could restore the balance, the driven leaf, nail old and rusted shoved through the bent bow. Each step through mirrors brings us back to the pitch of sleeplessness, the unstrung dream, an oil slick on an ocean still and black. As if all the song bring the murmuring tree back could restore wind to the rigging, full sail to the morning light. How many years, messages, wars, strange incidences, ironies. The wary eye of the mother wanted to protect her child, promise more, cities near the sea, clear waters, full sail, the morning light. This is another poem from Frozen Spring, my first book, <clears throat> which begins with an epigraph by the late 
naturalist Faith McNulty. Ascension. It takes seven strong men to drag the six foot heart of a blue whale across the deck of a whaling ship. Beads of sweat well up on the sea stained faces of the seven men who bear the still warm heart of the blue whale to the boiling vats. The men are deliverers. They tug, rip, tear the heart across the deck to the seething pots, but their hands stick to surfaces like flypaper and recoil, the red matter teething into fingers as if leaching out the blood. Ventricles gaping mouths stand ajar. Red smoke rises in the darkening mist. Harsh wind wraps against crevices, something trying to get back in, tapping out an aberrant beat, an unknown code, and something whines long and low, a sea moan. Only a crane can lift a six-foot heart, and as the last inch of the raised organ recedes into the stewing vats, Dismembered parts of the heart ascend and billow over the deck. Seven men inhale the vision, their hearts slackening with each breath. And from my, poem, my book, Crack Piano, I wanted to read one poem. My mother is dying, in el which is an elegy for my mother and for nature. My mother is dying. In a place where she belongs, suffering erases itself. Doves bring her seeds, horses sleep next to her in the straw. Where she belongs, a welcoming place holds her, keeps her from running away, the green greenness of the hay turning to gold. Already the rain's restless trajectory, my mother is busy dying. She no longer knows my name. This is the wind of Eden, the wand of change, the last slave of silence, the knave of rain, so quiet the roving of each vacant quest, let her be buried in the sea by the sea berry, the briar rock, the fossil chamber, alone blown roadside stray, the flown restless wayward ringing, bells clang, ocean downcast rolls, Wandering again, now I return to the center, searching the level earth, calling her name, remembering that I am lost. The path unfurls before my dog and me walking to the rocks, the ocean on one side, the bay on the other, eiders blessing the waves. The seagull's spontaneous burst, how it hurts with the radio blaring. My mother is dying, gone from a body that has abandoned her. Cry because everything goes haywire, because this is Apollo's siren lyre, the field-worn answer, the childless response, children waiting for some God to bring them home. And I wanted to read some poems from my latest book, The End of Horses. The Supreme Court decision to eliminate abortion rights is a foreshadowing of many other hard fight fought rights that MAGA justices like Thomas would like to take away. After overturning Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court quickly followed with an ominous ruling on a case that weakened EPA's already feeble response to climate change. While many of the poems in The End of Horses are about the sixth extinction, the only mass extinction precipitated by humans, some are on the fragility of the human family. Galloping double, and my book is titled The End of Horses, as mentioned. Galloping double bareback. Down sandy edges of paved country roads without helmets, bareback. The sisters clung to each other, to the horse, to the tree-lined ways that snaked around and through, as if going somewhere were not the goal. Their bodies twinned, hair wind whipped, the triple rocking of legs pounding, the leaping beat of hooves. The girls struggle to stay the horse rippling through them like storm. Wind battered trees that framed the hush of birds silenced by their galloping. The muddy paths, the morning dove, soft eyed windows of distant houses. Head down, the quieted horse plowed through 
grasses, his massive form sleek, willowy. So much did they long, long for the beast's velvet nose to be buried in their arms. One of the most dreaded days of my high school featured the posture picture. Posture pictures. In the seventh grade, Ms. Plemons, excuse me. In the seventh grade, Ms. Plemons, she of the short cropped hair behind the black curtain focused her camera obscura on our shuddering profiles, our nascent breasts, as we slumped forward, shoulders caved in, concealing what was barely there. The rage in the 50s and 60s, Yale and Princeton took them along with Mount Holyoke, Vassar, and the Oregon Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Later in class, she informed us the Nazis had amassed troves of college yearbook for racial study. That the tobacco industry paid Professor W.H. Sheldon of Columbia Institute of Physique Studies to find that smoking cigarettes made men more manly, but discovered instead it depleted sexual appetites. If she told us about Sheldon's study of human bodies to predict future achievement and prevent the breeding of useless humans I've forgotten. I can still see them on the flimsy photocopy that Miss Plemons passed around, his shaved head, his barely contained rage, that familiar sneer of a man who would spend his last lonely days reading detective stories, who believed he could judge people by the outlines of their silhouettes. For the phone interruption, I brought my phone in because I wasn't sure that I was going to get be able to get on since I had gotten kicked off and everything was different. So anyway, then my cell phone is here making way too much noise and I'm sorry. So I wanted to read um, a poem about autumn. Brittle leaves. The cat scampers toward me, her jaw clenched a feathery object so tiny it fits in the clamp of the tight sweet jaw of the one who sleeps in my bed each night, rests her furry back against mine and purrs a serenity purr. She drops the intricate body on the driveway, the hard asphalt driveway littered with a few leaves, brittle autumn leaves. One of our neighbors, a well-known environmental lawyer, professor, and writer, Nick Robinson, said that if we do not significantly address climate change right now, in the not too distant future, only a few humans will be living in Northern Canada. <coughs> Tree house. Something about roots, bone-like, tenacious, that grip the moving ground, the branches, like umbrellas, bent back and broken by the storm. The leaves veined references to hands and the sound of the winds wild working against the leaves. The boy collected the branches and stored them under his bed. Something about the tree seeped into his dreams, the trunk, a hallway, the branches outlined rooms, and his family finding shelter in the boughs, listening to the sound language of leaves. He did not see a garden, apples, or any fires. Everyone huddled together to keep warm. <clears throat> One of my sons and his wife run an organic farm in East Concord, New Hampshire. For many years, because of warmer winters, ticks have multiplied and at an astronomical rate. And because of that, now the moose is dying out in New Hampshire and Maine. <coughs> and um, I'm trying to find, here it is, ghost moose. <coughs> Searching for moose, the children run down to the river, calling the already gone, the forgotten, to wallow in stench, the smell of skunk weeds. Moose calves become ghosts, rubbing fur, skin, scraping ticks off on tree bark. In mild winters, ticks multiply and multiply, occupy moose calves, killing them slowly. Their mothers witness starvation from blood loss. 
Moose calves resemble ghosts, tearing fur, skin. Calves waste away, wasted bodies, frighten the forest floor. Foresters call April the month of death. I wanted to read a poem <clears throat> in honor of the 1,100 dolphins, mutilated dolphins that washed up on the shore of France a couple of years ago. And this scene has repeated itself over and over again. They were mutilated by their attempts to get to the surface to breathe. The atrocity is permitted and repeated be, be, because trawlers work in pairs and dra drag a net between them. And as a result, the European, Pian, the European dolphin serving as bycatch is on its way to extinction. Ballad of the Dolphin. Ancient Greeks said they should be treated as humans. Their sailors would not kill dolphins. Out of you caught in the fishermen's nets, they would set them to tra trap you to catch the tuna that swam under your schools. How the fishermen hung you still alive upside down, your cries brought others. Fishermen grabbed you by your tail, strung you, and turned you, head down in water, tied you to lifting hooks, and dragged you to the docks. If any of you were still alive when they slung you on cement, they stabbed you. How last survivors churned the water red, leaping in panic, waiting to die. In a good catch, it took them three days to kill all of you. How mothers whose calves were entangled could not lift them to the surface. They listened to their helpless underwater clicks and sighs. How often I remember the whale skippers who would radio the location of hundreds of you, allowing tuna fishermen to track down your entire pod, their nets deep, foaming, wide, so that hundreds could fit inside. How they used underwater sound to confuse and drive you down. How many of you drown? Fishermen did not want to compete with you, but killing you was not enough. How they used to scream several to slaughter more. How one of you hangs from the prow, still alive, calling, calling. All the proceeds from my book will go to the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. <clears throat> and um, the next poem, I borrowed her great broken heart from Galway Cannell's poem, St. Francis and the Sow. Litany of the Sow, <clears throat> In, and this begins with an epigraph by Michael Moss. Industry-wide, about 10 million piglets are crushed by their mothers each year, according to pig production experts, and studies have pointed to bigger litters as a major contributor, Michael Moss, New York Times. Farmers drug her to birth more piglets in a cage so small they cannot move. Her piglets cry out in pain. Bones dig in her skin. There was an old woman who lives in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. It doesn't matter, nothing she can do. Fourteen piglets suckle at her teats. She shifts her body to keep from losing limbs. Hear her moans. Her baby's bones tear skin, nothing she can do. Under her weight, her great broken heart, sighs of last breaths, the shudders, bones of her own, she can barely move, bones slash into her skin. They bind her in steel, she cries out, 14 piglets suckle at her teeth, she cannot move to comfort them. This little piggy went to market, this little piggy stayed home. This little piggy, bones broken, bones dig in her great broken heart. And I wanted to read a poem that I wrote when we sold our house in Florida. Farewell. It orchid. How I have loved you, the subtle dream of your varying blue colors, the verdant arc of your stem, how you are happy only in certain places, how much else we have in common no one knows. Goodbye in my backyard, 
full of palm trees swishing, bristling, full of tiny lizards who climb up the screen porch to bathe in South Florida sun. Goodbye are two lounge chairs by the pool where I never sat, but always thought lovingly of you, of bathing in the sun. Goodbye all the mighty bird sounds, the egrets, the great blue herons, the anhinga who spread her wings to dry. Goodbye to the sullen creature I glimpsed by the pool's edge. Whether you are a Nile monitor lizard or Argentine tegu, I will never know. When I rushed out after the dog's bark scared you away, I found another lizard you had chased into the pool and I rescued him. As if he didn't know whether he lived or died, he crouched, stunned and mute in the grass, but he too has run away. Goodbye, my hibiscus. I have forsaken you because you couldn't survive the trip back up north. Goodbye, intermittent showers that pour from one cloud like a teapot while neighboring skies remain blue and sunny. How I have loved you all. And I just have a couple of more short poems. I wanted to read, read the title poem, which is End of Horses. End of Horses. I write to you from the end of the time zone. You must realize that nothing survived after the horses were slaughtered. We sleep below the hollow burned out stars. We look into dust bowls searching for horses. When you walk in the country, you will be shocked to meet substantial masses on the road. We do not know whom to blame or where the horses were driven, who slaughtered them or for what purpose. Had the horses slept under the linden trees? the generals and engineers pucker and snore on the veranda. The last poem that I'll read is the last poem in the book, which is titled Ocean Birds. Ocean Birds, jealous is the night, the feckless night, coming over us as water into sea, the forceful day's geography turned black. Your body is the sea I float upon, your skin becomes the waves. Nothing will ever bring you here to me. Nothing will ever call you back. And I just wanted to say a few words about Slappering Hall Press, which is a press that <clears throat> I founded in 1990. Susanna and I are co-editors, and so is Mervyn, Tom, Mervyn Taylor, another wonderful poet. Um, who I hope you can hear read sometime soon. And it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, chapbook press in the United States. Every year, Slapping Hall Press holds a chapbook contest for poets who have not previously published in book form. The deadline is June 15th, and you can check out the press and the guidelines on the Hudson Valley Writers Center website because the press is a small press imprint of the Hudson Valley Writers Center. The website is www.writerscenter.org. And we also publish a conversation chapbook, which is the work, work of a master poet, a master woman poet who chooses an emerging poet, woman poet to appear with her in the same chapbook with an interview at the end. This year we published The Mothers by Dorian Lox and Leila Chatty. We have also published the work of Elizabeth Alexander, Toy Derricott, Kimiko Han, Kim Adonisio, Denise Duhamel, and many other truly amazing women poets who have chosen equally phenomenal emerging women poets to appear with them. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Margo and Susanna, for sharing your beautiful poetry. Margo, I had to turn off the video. I had a meltdown out during your my mother is dying poem it's beautiful oh thank you thank you and very powerful um thank does you. any i'm going to unmute um folks to make sure that uh we can uh if there's any questions any comments there were some comments um in the question and answer cindy bear um uh fabulous reading susanna and margo so happy to hear these poems from frozen spring again um, and I wanted to make sure that I have the title correctly of the book that uh, where the proceeds are going to the dolphins, Margot. What's the name of that? 
It's an or it's a nonprofit organization called Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, and they try to protect the ocean. And by, the book that you you said that all I the said proceeds, the proceeds, in other words, the money right. that I make from right. the sale and of the, the book. Title, right, the title, right? The title of the book. Oh, the end of horses. The end Thank of horses. You. Yeah, Thank that's you. my latest book. The end of okay. horses. I think Susanna put something about it in the chat. I put the links up if you scroll up. I'm not sure the links though are go. It says it's going to the host and panelists, so I'm not sure. Um, you want to do it to everyone. You when you when you send to, I'll put it up. Let me yeah, see. Is yeah, it I the, don't have the option? Apparently. Broadstone book. No, that's Susanna. Which one is? The end of horses is also Broadstone. Book. Yeah, it's Broadstone. Broadstonebooks.com. Both. Okay. Both of our Got books it. that oh. we mostly read from our broadstonebooks.com. Okay. But each of us has a website, so you can yeah. find our other books on the website if anyone's interested. All right. I'm going to... Um, I've been posting links, but I see they're only going to the host and panelists, and I don't have the option to... See, I, that was, I, I was trying to figure uh, out how to post to everyone, and then it kicked me off the whole thing, and that's why I ended up, that's why I ended up you know, being kicked off. But anyway... That's life in the fast lane, right? <laughs> no worries. It'll get reposted. Um, everyone has it. Okay. Um, and so can can you talk about your writing process? Um, you take turns. How do you how do you how do you put together your pieces? Um, do you what's your can you talk about your process? How do you you want to go first? You can go. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that my most successful writing has taken place after keeping a journal, which I highly recommend for anyone interested in writing poetry and just keeping a journal with all of your thoughts and ideas, no matter what they are, without censorship. And that's the way, like, um, most of my poems have have come to life okay from, a, from the journal but sometimes every once in a while a poem is just born you know just by writing that's very infrequent usually it's <clears throat> more like an orchestration process where I really put it together over time sometimes over 30 years but anyway okay. it's a it's a long process of writing but so there are really so many different right, ways of writing a poem I think well, your first piece where you um, incorporated Bertolt Brecht, I hadn't heard about of Bertolt Brecht, the, the, you know, the theater of the proletariat um, in a long time. So when you said his name, I thought, oh, so <laughs> when you, how did that one come about? If you, was it through your journal writing or were you inspired by something you read by him? Actually, or? I mean, I think I wrote, I really think I started to write that poem in about 19... 77 when I we were living at, my husband was teaching at Dartmouth environmental law at Dartmouth and I was there and I went to a conference on Brecht mm. and so that's when I started working on that poem and and then I I probably wrote it and I don't know when I wrote it but late 70s early 80s um okay so yeah I mean it was just from the conference and then <clears throat> I just wrote it I mean I don't I don't quite know how I did it but because it was so long ago, but yeah. Okay. I, I don't keep a journal, um, but sometimes I will write down lines that pop in my head and I will try to write a poem around them. A lot of my poetry is inspired by uh, things I read, things I've experienced, memories I have, um, art that I see. Uh, the damage done uh, was... Uh, uh, evolved out of a, a, a decades-long interest in the COINTELPRO program, mid-century COINTELPRO program of J. Edgar Hoover and feeling I wanted to write about it in some way. And then the writing coalesced around this uh, central character, the, um, the uh, almost the uh, objective correlative, if you wish, for the uh, harassment that went on during that period. Um, 
more recently, uh, because I've been a, a student of a, the Italian language for over a decade, in order to try to improve, I started watching this uh, Italian telenovela that's been running for 26 years. <laughs> and um, I and um, I don't know how successful the it, it has been in improving my Italian, but it inspired a whole bunch of poems based upon the uh, telenovela episode. Wow. So yeah, all, all, poems come from all kinds of things is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. The piece about the, the, the young woman that went to her aunt who lived in the log cabin, it was such a, I just saw it was so, I don't, I, it was almost like a movie. I felt those scenes just really were really sharp they were meant it was meant to be visual yeah. i mean not it thinking was. of the movie but it was meant to have a lot of um, um it really was i in it very clear how long ago did you write that piece was that um the book was written during the pandemic okay but that piece in particular came during that time as well the Yes, the whole, oh, wow. the whole thing came during oh, the pandemic. Wow. Okay. Does anybody else have any? Um, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, da, da, da. I don't see any other. One thing that... Um... I might mention is the Hudson Valley Writers Center has a great reading series. It's again, it's www.writerscenter.org and, and it's on Zoom and many of them are, are hybrid. Some are just on Zoom. Um, and um, also they have a really good workshop series. So they have first rate poets and fiction writers teaching workshops. So if people might want to check that out as well. As I did Slappering, add the link, yeah, the link. Yeah, as well as Slappering Hall Press, which is on www.writerscenter.org. Okay. So the press also offers classes? No, the Hudson Valley Writers Center. Oh, the, the, the Hudson I, Valley. I actually oh, okay. founded, um, I founded the Writers Center. Okay. Too. And, but long ago in 1983, I mean, started as a poetry series in 83. But anyway, um, and I'm no longer connected to the Writers Center except through Slappering Hall Press, but they they have a reading series and a workshop series, and they run that. And, and but it's reading, excellent. The readings are accessible via Zoom. Zoom That's Zoom. great. That's great to know. Um, Margo, when you taught the class Poetry and Bioethics, did you are you going to do it again? Is that was just a one off or? Well, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, they then the pandemic happened and they had a decline in um, enrollment. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure, you know, whether they're going to be able to offer it again. But, you know, I I, I, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, I've done I've done classes there since then, but I haven't done a whole a whole course. OK. I thought that was really a gr fascinating and I, I thought it would have been a very interesting class. So it was I it, I spent a year preparing for it because I just wow. you know, I was so you know because it eight hour eight hours a day five for five days on Zoom <laughs> so it was, I was really worried exhausting <laughs> yeah I, can I just only was, imagine yeah I just really worked hard to try to put it together it, it was exciting it took me a whole year but that's it that's the joy of being an adjunct right. <laughs> so and the end result were there were there poems were there pieces that were read or shared or oh yeah sure definitely people wrote poems yeah and... people wrote poems in the workshop it was a writing workshop as well as learning workshop it was both. okay that's yeah. worth that's I think that was I think the university should have put a spotlight on that and really <laughs> it was exciting know. it was exciting Bring it back. <laughs> yeah, it was exciting to put together. So. Well, if no one has any other any other questions, any other comments, um, I just want to thank you both for for coming. 
uh, and yeah. sharing your beautiful pieces.